My name is Dr. Chris Jenkins, and I am the CEO of the Orient Society and the host of the Snake Talk podcast, the podcast where you learn about nature's most feared, maligned, and persecuted animals. I invite you to listen to this conversation, and maybe you'll find that what you perceive as fear is actually rooted in a deep fascination. Welcome to the Snake Talk Podcast. We have a returning guest, Bob Ashley, who is the director of the Cherokee Desert Museum, which he founded with his wife and has been going strong now for many years. Um, but we're really going to focus on a project that that you know he's been working on and kind of just came to fruition, and that's um, the publication of a book. And um, I have not read the book yet. It is going to be one that, uh, you know, that I end up adding to my collection. And um, hopefully after this episode, um, all of us are going to be uh, doing that exact same thing. But it's on a very uh, interesting topic to me. And that's the idea of uh, snake bite treatment. And, uh, you know, I do a lot of snake bite safety and treatment type presentations in a variety of venues. And, you know, I'm always, uh, you know, the, the f- kind of the comical part of those presentations is that a lot of, uh, a lot of what I tell people to do in the field for snake bite treatments is really what not to do. And, um, and, and so this book brings in another um, kind of a, an interest of mine, you know, actually was my original major in college, um, and that's history. And, you know, I've always thought that a, a lot of these things I'm teaching people not to do with snake bite treatment was kind of rooted um, in history and things that were told and, and passed down through generations. And uh, so, again, this book's on the history uh, of snake bite treatment. So, uh, so I think it's going to be an exciting one. Welcome to the podcast again, Bob. How are you doing today? Good, Chris. Good, uh, good to be talking to you. Yeah. Well, we won't go through you know the detailed history of how you ended up where you are today um, in your uh, position, but but why don't you at least kind of give everybody an intro to just who you are and, and what you do on a day-to-day basis and maybe in particular how that relates to publishing and books. Sure. Um, well, uh, I started eco-publishing. Uh, me and my wife uh, started that about 20, uh, 20 some years ago and um, published many books. Uh, started at NERBC with Brian Potter. Um, we ended up moving to Rodeo, New Mexico, the Portland, Arizona area where we opened up the Chiricahua Desert Museum. Uh, that's been open for 15 years now. Uh, I've always been interested in books. In fact, we're just finishing building on a 5,000 square foot library. That's going to be uh, the largest library for herpetology ever done. So uh, I'm probably an idiot for doing something like this uh, in the middle of the desert when everyone's getting rid of their books. But I'm finding a place to, for those these books to go. So, um, so anything to do with books, I've always been interested in. And putting this book together has been a lot of fun. And it, it kind of started from... You know, I actually started collecting kits um, because of John Can, and I, he's a good friend of mine in Australia. And I would go over there, and we'd go out snake hunting, and he'd, he'd send me out with some of his mates. And, well, he was interested in collecting these kits. So whenever I would go over there, I would always scroll away two or three or four of these kits for him to bring over his collection. So as I did this, I became intrigued by them because they were so eclectic, so bizarre, you know. Some had strychnine in them. Some had, you know, just anything you can think of, the different blades and the different tourniquets and things in there. So um, I, then all of a sudden um, I was offered a, a couple of different kits, collections, and I ended up buying them. Then I ended up actually giving all my duplicates to John. <laughs> and then uh, once John retired, I ended up getting a bunch of kits back from him and a bunch of really rare stuff. And he helped me a lot with the book. So that's kind of how the origins of, of doing this book started. Um, but it's been a, it's been fun just collecting all the different snake oils and snake bite kits. And I did this for years, you know, and uh, our science director, Gordon Shewitt, uh, Dr. Gordon Shewitt, uh, he uh, he said, you know what? All these really amazing things you have here, you should do a book on it. So Gordon helped me and we put this book together. So that's kind of how it started. 
Yeah, well, that's a really good point. If you do want to see a lot of this, you know, if you go to the museum there in New Mexico, um, you know, there's there's a lot of components of it. You know, you'll see a lot of the live animals from the region and some of that. But there's this great um, room that just displays, um, you know, I, I guess kind of artifacts, cultural artifacts, and I'm assuming um, this is where you display uh, a lot of these types of kits that you might show. We have two display cases filled with kits, you know, going back to the uh, early 1800s, you know, mid 1800s. So uh, some pretty interesting and some different snake oils and, and different uh, ephemera uh, supporting it as well. I'm, I'm big into that. Yeah. So the book's titled A Photographic History of Snake Bite Treatment, Bad Medicine, Snake Oils, um, Potions, elixir, Elixirs, and Kits. And um, so you talked a little bit about the origins and your, your connections in Australia. Um, but maybe, you know, uh, I would say that a lot of people that are into snakes probably don't have the same, um, you know, depth of interest in history or, or at least haven't dived into it, dove into it as much. So, I mean, how did that origin come about for you? You're obviously really involved in, in all aspects of snake science, conservation, education, outreach. Um, and it seems like in the museum, you've been able to really kind of merge that interest um, with history and, and you know, some of the artifacts from history. So uh, before you even had that very direct kind of snake bite kit interaction, how, how did that come about? How did you kind of bring all of those things together? Well, since I was a, a young young lad, I would collect every, anything, you know, books especially, but anything that was reptile related. And uh, and I I've always wanted to do some kind of a museum, so that was kind of my excuse. Would be either that or I'm a hoarder. So I became I opened up a couple <laughs> different museums. So uh, where I've gone with it, but I've been collecting different artifacts since I was a kid. I'd go to the different SSCR auctions or different Herb Society meetings and IHS and and, uh, and and so on. And I'd always try to eat up with the, the coolest one or two things that they had in the auction, you know. And a lot of times the stuff I wanted, no one else wanted. So uh, it was all these little, little weird historical things that you know, no one really cared about, but I always did. So that's kind of how it's everything started with the museum. You know, I had been collecting this stuff for many years. Um, as far as snakes, I started... I think my first venomous snake was a couple baby eastern massasagas when i was about 14. i had i got in michigan and uh i was just intrigued you know i was intrigued by them and uh when i started a collection of uh, montane rattlesnakes and i think at one time we had up, up, up over 50 uh when we opened the museum and uh we thinned that down to where we have mostly just stuff from the uh the southwest and sky islands because we had a lot of stuff from the east coast and larger animals that were probably too dangerous to have where we are because they um, could inflict a pretty bad bite. And because we're a two hour ride from the nearest hospital, I didn't want to have anything that could potentially kill anybody, myself included, but also we have staff and curators and so on. So um, we thinned down the collection to about 35 species, but uh, the ones we have are quite rare and we breed them. And uh, it's been a, it's been a, it's been fun to, to learn how to, to keep these animals. And the interesting thing, a lot of them, we have a refrigerated room. Uh, a lot of these animals, we only feed about six to seven times a year. Um, they're cooled down a lot. The air temperature in the room, even the warm time is 65 degrees. So um, there's hot spots that come on throughout the day, but uh, that's the best way to keep these things. So for, for snake maintenance or pet maintenance in general, um, this is a little bit harder than keeping a pet rock because <laughs> you keep refrigerated, they eat very well. It's also a good question. Great. Well, we've talked a little bit about the book and a and, uh, number of other um, aspects of, of snake bite treatment. But what I really want to learn is, is how, did, uh, how did this idea come about? What was it that you know, really, really prompted you to, to want to write this book and, and uh, you know, just kind of that origin story? Well, you know, I, uh, it kind of started with my, uh, my interest for snake bite kits in general kind of started when... Uh, uh, I met John Can and I saw his snake bucket collection and I thought that was pretty neat. And I, um, the next several visits, uh, I went to see him over in Australia. I would come across these kits or I'd buy them on eBay or whatever. And I would bring them to him as and I'd give them to him as a gift. And, you know, most of these were very inexpensive and just kind of, you know, interesting anyway. And, uh, as time went on, um, I had a couple of opportunities to buy big collections 
And, uh, well, then I really got into it and, uh, and I, I kept moving forward and I, I bought snake oils and snake kits. And, uh, and then John ended up giving me a lot of other stuff back as he you know, retired and worked on some of his books, which he's done with, with snakes alive and historical snakies. Um, two books that I was honored to publish with him years ago are amazing, uh, amazing amounts of information that are not even included in this book. But, um, those are two books that some people should probably look at acquiring if they are interested in the history of snake bite. Um, but, uh, that's really how my interest for the, all this got into it, you know, and, uh, uh, Gordon Shewitt, uh, which I have this collection of kits and oils, uh, on exhibit at the museum, Gordon Shewitt, who's our science director, he mentioned, you know, he said, this stuff is so interesting. Uh, we should do a book on that, you know, or in fact, he said, you should do a book on that to me. And of course, uh, Gordon is so, such a great writer and such a great editor and everything else. I couldn't even begin to think about doing something without him. So, we went down the task. I had a friend of mine photograph all the kits and we started putting it together. Um, uh, Jason Watkins and Chuck Smith both were very uh, good at helping to lay it out, find some kind of a, a rhythm to our process and uh, and the art behind making it look good. So I'd like to thank those guys for what they did in the book as well. Um, and then, of course, people like uh, Bill Hayes and Kimberly Wyatt, um, they wrote an amazing introduction. Uh, and actually, once I read their introduction, I thought, boy, these guys should have written the book because they know way more than I do about this topic. Again, these people are toxicologists. They really know their, their game. So you know, writing this book was a huge amount of learning for me. So I got to do a lot of research and learn about a lot of this stuff that I didn't know previously. So um, it started out as just a guy who collected snake bite kits and snake oils, and I learned a lot in acquiring them and then researching it for this book, but uh, couldn't have done it without. And of course, Sir David Worrell, uh, which I, in fact, when I asked him to write the foreword, this man has saved thousands of lives. And that's why he's knighted by, by Queen Elizabeth. And uh, I asked him to do the foreword in the book because he's done so much for tropical disease, snake bite overseas, like in Sri Lanka and in India, that uh, I wanted him to kind of give us the blessing of, of his wise. Whenever I've heard him do a talk, it's like, I feel so stupid because he's so wise and so smart. And uh, and then after he agreed to do the fort, I found out he was knighted. So I'm like, what a great honor to have uh, Sir David Worrell, <laughs> the four in the books. Yeah. <laughs> well, so, you know, we've, we've just kind of scratched the surface on the book and we're going to get into a lot more detail. Bef but before we do that, you know, from your perspective, you know, we've talked about kind of your interest and what prompted this, but, um, you know, why do you think myself and, and our audience and just kind of people who are interested in, in snakes or history or medicine, um, you know, why do you think this is a book that, that, you know, we should all put on our shelves? What makes it special in your mind? Well, I think the most important thing is you can go to a, uh, a hardware store, an out, goods, an out goods store right now, sporting goods, and you can still buy these snake bite kits, believe it or not. None of them do anything at all. They never have. So the fact that if you could only learn that don't waste your 12 or $13 or whatever they cost, they've got electric shock ones, they've got the old cutter style you can still buy. If all you learn from that is call 911, go to the hospital, be careful with the snakes, but certainly don't go out and buy a snake bite kit. Or buy snake oil because uh, none of that works. So that's probably the most important thing for the general public to realize that all these kits and all the stuff that they used to go around camping with and their grandparents used to have and always made sure they had with them, they don't do anything at all. A Band-Aid would have been more effective, actually. Hmm. And so as you go through the book, um, do you, you know, you're, you're talking about the history, but do you also um, touch on... Um, your thoughts or you know your colleagues thoughts on say the potential effectiveness even of some of these very very ancient um you know remedies well we had um the nice thing is we had some of the best people like uh sir david worrell and uh, steve mackesy and uh, bill hayes and some of these people that are phds that are much, much more knowledgeable than I am when it was stuff. And they actually work as toxicology in the field of venom. So they had a lot of input in the book as far as introductions and forwards. And uh, what we try to talk about mostly in the book was th th basically that these kits don't do anything at all. They don't work at all. That's what the, the summary, summary of the entire book. Um, we talk about what we 
just decided was probably the most toxic, deadliest snake in the in the in the world. Uh, we use venom yields and location to populations uh, and uh, and toxicity to do that. And uh, that was a salt scale viper. But you know, really, you talk about that or the Russell's viper. Either one of those are both kill thousands of people. And I think a lot of people don't realize that it's considered a tropical disease and tens of thousands of people die every year from snake bite. Yeah. Not in our country. I mean, we get maybe two or three in our country, yeah. but it's just a matter of medical, you know, medical action. Yeah. We've had some organizations on that, that work on snake bite treatment in, um, you know, less developed countries. And, um, yeah, it, it really is a disease in those places in, in a sense. And a lot of people are, are dying. So, uh, I'm just curious, kind of along those lines. So you do kind of weigh in on, in, at least in an overall sense of, of you know, you know, the fact that you think most or all of these kits had, you know, little to no value. Um, and then going back even further in time, you know, I think in the book uh, you mentioned you go back to like Egyptian times, and I'm sure people have had snake bite remedies as long as humans and venomous snakes have, have been in contact. And so I'm just curious if there were any, if there were any kind of remedies from, from real, um, real long ago, I don't know, we'll call it prehistoric, but, um, you know, really old remedies that, that any of, you know, you and your colleagues kind of looked at and, and thought that's interesting. Um, well, there were uh, uh, the first snake oil, the first snake antidote was by uh, a guy by the name of, uh, oh, what was his name? Um, just, it'll, um, it'll come to me, uh, Underwood, Underwood's uh, antidote. And his stuff was about 1844. And there were several uh, after that, like Muller. Uh, and, but none of those, even though there were people that were swore by it. In fact, here's an interesting story. Um, so this, is, this happened back uh, with, uh, there was one of these snake oil salesmen. That was in Australia, and a lot of this, a lot of these were really early in Australia. And a guy was up there preaching to the audience, which is a small group in a small town, and he let a tiger snake bite him. And he had no ill effects. Now, some of these people would let snakes bite them; they, be, they would become immune, uh, and they could take a bite from, from a very deadly snake. And you can also become hypersensitive that way too. So that's not necessarily going to work. Uh, Bill Haas did that. In fact, they did uh, anti, uh, they did uh, transfusions with his blood to treat people with snake bit back back in the early part of the 19th century uh, <clears throat> 1900s i'm sorry but it's it's amazing on some of that stuff but this guy let a snake bite him on the lip and he had no ill effects or very few the the mayor of the town went up there and let the snake bite him he tried to stop him well that guy died um so the mayor of the town died uh he probably sold a lot of snake oil <laughs> yeah the antidote which I mean, you, you don't know that the thing about that, you buy the oil back in those days for whatever it was. And if it worked, if you didn't die, it could have been a dry bite or or you just happen to live through it. And um, well, then they say, oh, it worked great. And then if you died, well, I guess you got a big, bad bite, you know. So there was no way to really, you know, mm-hmm. no, there's no way to really know. It didn't work. None of them, none of them work. I mean, do you, you have know, any? A lot of them. Well, I've always had that thought, even like today, like you said, you can go into a lot of say Walmarts or, or whatever store and, and find snake bite kits. And they include things that, you know, are part of my recommendations on things not to do. Um, and, you know, and I've always just thought of it like that it, it, it a huge segment of our population is so afraid of snake bites. It's a, it was like horrific. It's almost, I mean, you, they make you sick. Don't get me wrong. They can make you sick or can kill you, but it, the chances of actually getting a bite and then the chances of dying are, are actually very, very low. It's blown out of proportion, I guess is, is what I'm saying. And so I've always Correct. just kind of wondered, um, you know, in, in modern days, if it's just a money-making scheme. Oh, that's all it is. It's just like a lot of the ads, a lot of the stuff you see at the vitamin stores and the, uh, the anti, uh, you know, the, the non-medical, non-FTA regulated stuff for having testosterone and, and all these things. It's all snake oil. It's just a different kind of snake oil. It's not treating snake bite. Um, but I was just going to say something. I forgot where, where I was going with it. But uh, what was the question you just asked me exactly? I was just asking. It was just right there to tip my tongue in there. About why it persists and 
probably why it persisted through time. And I've always suspected that it was it was just uh, you know money making basically. Money making and hokum, and the one the one treatment that you can get, which can help buy you some time. If you're bitten by an elapid, they have a pressure bandage, like it's basically just a stretchy piece of gauze you stretch around your arm, and by putting a, a light pressure on your arm, that can help delay the effects of the venom. So, especially if you're like an Australian, you're bit by a death adder or a tiger snake or something like that, or even a cobra uh, in Asia, yeah, a pressure bandage seems to work, you know. And but all it's doing is delaying. Delaying the effects of the venom. I mean, it's not, it's not nothing you just put on like, oh, I'm good. No, I might buy you a little time to get to the hospital, but that's what I'm doing, you know. Um, yeah. there's, there's, there's all kinds of stuff, of course, and, and so on, that to treat this. There's actually a new inhibitor. Uh, they're going through trials right now, and it's a, it's a pill you take orally that will help in, inhibit the effects of venom in your system. So it won't replace antivenom, but it'll help. Again, like that pressure bench, to help delay the onset of these things for especially third world countries where you can just take this pill. It'll delay the onset of these effects. And right now it works really well with neurotoxic uh, venoms. There, it works a little bit with some of the hemotoxic properties, but they're still working that out. But uh, it's a huge, huge, it's going to be a huge thing for the world, especially with uh, these third world countries. If they have access to giving a guy, a kid, a pill that got bit out there working the rice paddies to buy him that time until they can get him to a hospital, get him to some antivenom. Yeah, that sounds great. I hadn't heard of that. So, Snakes are one of the most persecuted groups of animals in the world, but we are dedicated to changing that. If you like what we've been discussing here on the Snake Talk podcast, here's an opportunity to turn that inspiration into action. Head over to www.orian.org and explore how you can support the Orian Society. Click on Take Action on our menu to make a difference. Uh, last question, and then we'll kind of move on. But, uh, you know, with these snake oils you're talking about, uh, do you have any feel from, you know, just kind of your research into history, whether, you know, I guess what were kind of in some of these oils and then were the people that were kind of marketing them, selling them, producing them, were they, did they know they were producing something? Were they just like throwing olive oil and, you know, a few different oils in a bottle and trying to sell it? Or, or do you know if they were truly trying to find um, a remedy for snake bite and they, they did believe that it would actually work? I think I think that most of these people probably d did not think it worked. Most of these people probably thought they're just trying to make a buck. Now they were they, they had everything from like snake oils to potassium, pernagdamate, strychnine, all kinds of different. But if you look at the Egyptian stuff, they they kind of did. They had their different chemicals, and some were alcohol based to to different oils and things like that. But the incantations and the gods that they would pray to. Like uh, they would, they would pray to Serket would be the main god that they'd pray to in Egypt to help with your snake bite. And in fact, she was on the sarcophagus of King Tut. You know, if you're bit by a viper, there was another there was another deity called Horus, and they'd specifically pray to that deity if you're bit by a viper. You know, the uh, the other thing too, if you look back at what the papyrus said, um, they were basically if you were bit by that, it was the gods let the snake bite you. And normally they would do that because you didn't, you weren't following the rules of the elder or the, or the king. So if you got bit by the snake back, then you were thinking, oh, people thought, oh, you had that coming probably, you know. So it makes people afraid. They say, oh, look, he got bit by the snake. What, what happened? To, what, did, what did he do? You know, was he with his neighbor's wife? Who knows? I don't know. But that was the way they used to uh, help control society, much like religion is today mm -hmm. and then. Yeah. <laughs> so that's another <laughs> Okay, well, let's let's focus in on the book a little bit more. So, you, um, how did you end up structuring um, the book? Just how is it kind of organized and, and put together, and what are some of the components within it? Is it kind of a chronological history or by topic? How, how, how did you do that? We started with uh, snake oils because that was they came before snake uh, anti uh, snake bite kits. So we tried to do it chronologically, and it took us a long time to try to find out where all these different kits came from, you know, finding the dates of these things that were done back 100 years ago. So uh, a lot of times we could find, like, we could find, well, the company that started was founded on this year, 
And that's all we could find. So we put that date in the book. Well, we know that this particular company founded it. And we found all kinds of interesting things like the uh, the kit that we found, the one kit that uh, uh, my friend has, uh, Mike Clarkston has a kit that was uh, made in Germany during the, during the uh, you know World War One. You know, it was in the 30s. And uh, uh, they had a, uh, an IRA, or it's a Jewish man started working on this process and actually ended up getting fired out of the university because he was Jewish, obviously, because of Hitler. Um, but he was brought back on to work on this because Hitler thought that this uh, these remedies had potential for making a, a human, uh, like superhuman soldiers. So even though he was Jewish, they had this guy on the back working on the stuff, thinking that it worked for that. Well, obviously, it didn't work for St. Bite any more than being superhuman soldiers. But, uh, but these types of things are fascinating to, to read. One of the, one of the kits we had, uh, we I, I got from a collection I bought was the Kellogg Venom Gun. And we looked and looked and looked and could not find anything about this at all. But looking at Kellogg's, like Kellogg cereal from Battle Creek, going back before that, they, they did all kinds of other different medical little devices, and they had a wellness clinic there to help people with all kinds of different ailments. And it's spelled exactly the same way, so we don't know for sure, but we're pretty sure that that was something that uh, the people who started Kellogg cereal started, which is pictured in the book. Which uh, So as we're doing the research and finding the stuff, it was just fascinating that every time we found some little clue, you know, about mm-hmm. this stuff, you know. And bibliographies and old books go a long way. It gives you kind of like a map to find some of the stuff where it's mentioned. Yeah, you but called again, it we found, but maybe we found two thirds of the information. If maybe that, not even that. So you just kind of put, put the best you can together. Yeah. And you called it a gun. So that particular device was, it, did it come actually in some form of a gum where you would deliver the oil like into your skin or how did that? Oh, it's a, it's a gun G U N and it has a little thing you unscrew off of oh. it. It's pictured in the book and it's, you, you poke your, and you poke yourself with it. So oh, okay. I've never tried using it, so I didn't. I don't. <laughs> so I make a joke yeah. with our uh, well, curator. I say, "Hey, if you ever give me lots of, we got lots of remedies here, but uh, don't <laughs> use them." Uh, so the um, so the book is structured kind of by topic. You've got snake oils, and then you've got kits, and then. Within that, it's somewhat chronological, it sounds like. You present a history within the subtopics. Is that accurate? Yeah, and then we ended it We ended it when we started talking about the beginning of antivenoms and, and who started that and, and kind of moving forward to where we are today. Oh, okay. And so that's there's, how three we ended main... there's three main sections. Snake oils, elixir, same thing, and then snake bite kits, and then we get into antivenoms. So we start talking about the history of Andy Johnson, who started it and how that all worked. Okay, great. Well, uh, let's, let's talk a little bit about the um, content of the book, if, if you don't mind. And so um, l- let's talk a little bit about the history of snake bite treatment. Um, and so maybe, maybe we'll kind of follow the chronology of, of your, or the structure of your book and, and maybe start with the snake oils. Um, so tell us a little bit about that. Just kind of give us an overview of the history of, of snake oils for, for snake bite treatment. Snake oils, basically, just like, you know, it's like a carnival atmosphere. You think, you think of a guy with a, with a horse-drawn carriage, kind of like what you'd see in the, the beginning of Wizard of Oz. You know, that, that man was a snake oil salesman. So here's this guy selling his different treatments for whether it be baldness or snake bite or rheumatism or whatever that was. And, and, and every little town had a traveling guy that would go through at some point selling whatever they thought would work, you know. And some of the stuff that, you know, whether it be uh, maybe they had some aloe lotions that helped with some dry skin, they may have some things that did work, but uh, the snake bite kits was definitely one that did not, you know. So that's kind of how it evolved. And then it, it, then people started coming up with kits and how to, like, cut. A lot of these were based on cutting yourself and trying to suck the venom out. You know, that's really where it went to, you know, Yeah. Uh, when kits started. So really, the oils and elixirs were kind of earlier in time, um, and those don't really exist today. Is that correct? Uh, they they do they do still exist today, but they're they're more of tongue and cheek humor. I think if you go online, you can still buy them, but I, I think that they're just bought as some kind of a, a carnival kind of a, a collectible. 
but uh, I don't think that they, I don't think people actually think that they work. And I don't think that they're actually, even though they may say on there, yeah, but that they're not selling them for that purpose. They're selling them to people that collect the weird, this weird stuff. So they're, they're take like an old, like an old snake oil bottle from the 17 or 1800s. And then they'll put a new label on it. They'll make it look old. So a lot of what you see out there is fake. So they're selling you this fake bottle. So, so that's kind of what's out there right now. But there's no snake oils being sold to treat snake bite. Yep. I always, you know, you mentioned the Wizard of Oz, or I can picture, you know, watching some Western set back in frontier times and, and uh, you know, snake oil salesman rolling through town. I've always thought watching those, um, you know, knowing that they didn't work, that, um, you must have to really kind of travel as that type of salesman. You don't want to go back to the same town because you probably ended up uh, with some pretty upset people. And especially in the United States, bites were very rare. So whether, you know, even if it didn't work, and a lot of people didn't buy, die from the snake bite. So mm -hmm. they say, look, it worked. You didn't die. Your hand may have fell off, <laughs> but you didn't die. So go back there and probably, hey, it worked great. You know, you know, whatever, you know, so, um, you know, you know, besides kits, like kind of like in, in there, like in the 60s, they developed, you've probably heard of the electric shock treatment for mm -hmm. a snake bite yeah, treatment. Of course. They would actually hook up to a car battery, electric shock. Well, that was started from what we could tell in the early 60s uh, in Ecuador. And a couple people, a couple professors went down from uh, Michigan to test it, and they actually thought that it worked. They actually thought that it worked. And then later on, uh, literally, in the, like not that much longer, like in the... Uh, 15 years later, another paper was done. Steve Maxey was one of the authors on it. But there was a paper done on it, and they did extensive testing on this. And, of course, they found that it does nothing at all other than they'll electrocute you. Yeah. So, but people have, they've come up with these, and you can still buy those kits um, on the Internet right now. I've got one that's in the book that, that you put a 9-volt battery in. It's called the Snake Doctor, and you're supposed to almost electric electrocute yourself. So, yeah, I good to stun your I, uh, you know. I think I've told this story on the podcast before, but many years ago, I was on a National Geographic expedition in Peru. And it was really remote. You know, we were gone for months and, and you know, really far from anything. And, um, and one of the one of the scientists on the on the expedition uh, had a dog with him, and he carried these small devices. And I don't know, maybe they were made for. There might be something like you're talking about. They're made for snake bite, but they would, you know, run on a small battery, and they would give an electric shock. And he swore by it. He he talked about his. Uh, you know, his dog getting a bite and then, you know, zapping the poor dog multiple times and dog surviving. But he carried, he had multiple in his pack on, you know, a two month hike through the Andes. And, uh, yeah, I just always thought in my head, it's like, that's, just, yeah, that doesn't work. But anyways, um, so back to the, uh, dogs have a, have a question bite because they're 99% wolf yeah. and wolves and coyotes are, have developed immunity. Right. So now they're not immune, but if a 40 pound dog gets bit by a Western Diamondback, they'll handle a lot better than a 200 pound human. Yeah. So they, they shake a lot of it off. Yeah. We did a whole episode. You might be interested in, uh, in it on um, snake biting dogs with a, a gentleman named uh, Dr. Sherry. He's a veterinarian down at University of Florida and she's one of the top dog vets for snake bite treatment. And that was a great episode. But, anyways, uh, so. Back to the uh, snake oils and, and elixirs. Uh, so I, I'm assuming, and maybe I'm wrong, but that even going further back in time than saying like the 1700s, 1800s, when you're going back to times, you know, like you're talking about the Egyptians or, or maybe other um, cultures at that time, that um, a lot of their treatment, you, you mentioned kind of praying to, to certain gods, but I'm assuming a lot of their treatments would have also been some type of oil or elixir. Is that true, or were they doing other things? No, it was, there were different oils and elixirs. Some of them you actually could take internally or, or put on orally, and sometimes they recommended both, you know. But mostly it was, and, and, and the, the first course we could go back was the Brooklyn Papyrus, which was about 3,000 years ago, and that was a snake papyri that was discovered and in fact there's a book coming out on it. we are we are we actually tried to work on it, it was it's beyond our capabilities with the hieroglyphics but uh they, they actually lockwood press is coming out with this book on the history of egyptian snake bite treatments and it's really fascinating and uh 
um, this book, uh, Gordon Shewitt, who's actually uh, my co-author on this product uh, that we did, this book uh, is also a uh, part of that book as well. So that's coming out probably in the next six months and it'll be a wealth of knowledge. And Gom, who uh, is an expert at being able to translate hieroglyphics, was a big part of that book too. It's his book. So we're just in the background mm-hmm. trying to like do something, but amazing book. So I'm yeah. really looking forward to that book coming out. And uh, so, you know, leaving the, the oils and elixirs, you talked about how that kind of evolved into these snake bite kits. Um, so talk a little bit about kind of the history of kits. When did they start coming about? Um, you know, what would, would say, you know, some of those first kits kind of included and all the way to, to where we are today, as we mentioned, snake bite kits still exist. So. Most of the kits started right, right, right around the turn of the century, as far as, uh, you know, maybe in the early, in the late 1800s. Um, but most of these kits were basically had like a tourniquet. They'd have like a little kind of a knife, which they called a, a, a lancet. And there's lots of different lancets with, made out of wood and bakelite and everything else as you move through the years. But it basically it was a lancet, uh, potassium pernagnamate. They'd use, sometimes they'd want to put strychnine in there. And sometimes they'd have like the different alcohols and different like little ointments and things like that. So, but both, that's basically what the kit was. And then they had suction cups as they developed rubber and things like that, but, or instructions to suck the venom out. That's, yeah, that's so, basically yeah so our kits today really haven't changed that that much to be honest with you so they've gone with some different things you can add to it but for the most part it's the whole thought is to cut where the bite was and to suck the venom out that's really where it comes down to and then have a tourniquet to help stop the, from the, the venom from traveling through your arm uh, so yeah. that's been pocket science and a lot of this stuff yeah. there was nothing out of the um, bubble you mentioned strychnine, which um, that's uh, one of the chemicals they use to kill rodents, correct? And I'm trying to remember how, yeah, what it a, does exactly. Very, I want to say it like breaks down blood and causes internal bleeding. Is that right? It's horrible. It's a, it's a horrible toxin. And uh, why they thought maybe it maybe would counteract with a, a venom. Uh, again, a lot of these people didn't realize. If you go back... Uh, Back to the 1600s, and I've, I've got a collection of old books on venoms. And back in the 1600s, you had uh, you had two different scientists. One was uh, they're both Italian. One was Charis, and one was Reddy. And they both had they had several copies of their books, different versions come out. Now Reddy knew that, or he thought that was his theory that if a snake bit you, that the saliva, the venom in their mouth, their fangs would go into you, and that would create all this problem, all this necrosis, and all this damage. Whereas Charis thought. And he was bit by a snake. He thought when you got bit by a snake that it was the passion and the anger from the snake was going into your body. And that's what it was. And they went back and forth, probably three different books, three different uh, versions of their books counteracting each other, saying, hey, no, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. Well, Reddy was the one was right, that was right. But there's, you know, this is, this is going back to the 1600s, which is somewhere in between, you know. But that's... Back then, they had no idea. They didn't know about venoms. They didn't know for sure what was going on. And later on, they, they, they found that ready. Obviously, we know that now is correct. Well, we've talked a little bit about the kind of the history of both snake oils as well as kits. Um, but, you know, there are this other major group of treatments, the antivenoms, which, you know, are being used today and, and can be very effective. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about the history of antivenoms and their use in snake bite treatment? Uh, sure. Well, that was something we researched to find out. We actually, a lot of people always thought Albert Calmetti was kind of the first guy to develop anti- antibodies and antivenoms. And he, uh, back in uh, <clears throat> 1887, developed uh, a, a cobra antivenom for rabbits. And that was kind of where most people thought it started. And then later on, uh, actually, we're getting close to actually publishing the book. And we were going through editing and all that. And I was with a good friend of mine, Dr. Uh, Craig Adler. And he was talking about another gentleman uh, that he actually re- published in uh, her review. And he was a little bit earlier, 1887. And his name was Henry Sewell. And he actually was doing experiments on pigeons with Eastern Massasagas up in Michigan in Ann Arbor. And he was the first one to actually develop. Uh, an antivenom. And uh, Albert Calmetti was actually over at one of his, uh, uh, what would you say, seminars he was doing on it. And Al- Albert Calmetti actually developed a lot of his work 
was doing stuff prior to that, but actually used a lot of the work that Henry Sewell did because of his interest in what he was doing. But they were both kind of like kind of like Darwin and uh, and uh, Wallace kind of like doing things at the same time. But I think uh, Henry Sewell beat him to the, de- the punch. So uh, so I want to make sure that those guys get credit. And of course, as we move forward with when you're talking about North America and anti-venom, you've got Wyeth who started anti-venom using horse serum. Then you had to move forward with Henry Russell kind of improving upon it with cheap. And uh, now you've got Anavip as well going forward now, uh, which uh, there's less allergic reactions with that. And, uh, and, you know, and we've been evolving. There's actually a new inhibitor coming out. And, uh, and this is going to be a pill that you can take orally. And this pill you can actually take and it'll inhibit the snake venoms, the snake's venom affecting your body. Now, it's only a temporary thing, so you're still going to need antivenoms, but it's going through FDA trials now, and this will be something that can save literally tens of thousands of lives a year, just especially in third world countries where someone can take this pill and get them to the hospital and get actual treatment before they just die in the field or lose a leg or something like that. So we've come a long way from where we started, and this book is about really where we started. And it ends with a little bit about the future, but it's just a, it's a travel through history, a photographic travel that kind of shows you everything from ancient Egypt all the way up till, you know, the 19, 1900s. Hmm. So we've talked about the, the oils and the, and the kits. Let's talk about, um, let's talk about anti-venom. Um, you know, the one, you know, you know, most effective or the effective treatment, um, for snake bite and, and talk a little bit about the history of that. When did they start coming about and maybe talk about some of those older ones were having more, um, say allergic reactions versus more modern, how they've changed over time. Sure. Um, well, one of the, uh, the, the, these wife is one of the first antivenoms that came out and they used a horse serum. And that was later improved by Finley Russell when he started using sheep to make the animal. So there was less allergic reactions to it. And they've, they've evolved beyond there. Then you've got um, RDT that's developed. Now, with Russ, uh, Finley Russell, he helped develop Crofab from the original Wyeth antivenom. Then we had Crofab, and then we had Anavip, which they went back to using a little bit different process. So there's a little bit less as far as um, uh, allergic reactions. But both are good antivenoms. You know, they both work. And our, our evolution has really not changed since in, in the last 20 years on that for, for very much. We're now we're just looking at this new inhibitor pill that will help a big, a big way in helping with the, slowing the onset of, uh, of the effects of the And correct me if I'm wrong, but I've always, I've always thought that antivenoms functioned as a remedy by blocking the ability of the venom to attach to cells in the body. Is that accurate? Or, or how is the anti-venom actually um, affecting the venom? Well, what you're doing is you're, you're, in, you're, you're just putting antibodies for that venom into your bloodstream that are already created by, let's say, a horse or a sheep or something like that. So you're putting yeah. these anti- antibodies like they were doing trans- from uh, Haas. They were taking someone who already has anti-venom or already has antibodies in his blood for another snake. They're putting it in there trying to add antibodies. Like a dog already has these because it's evolved over the years being bitten by snakes. Wolves and coyotes eat snakes. So they're used to getting bitten and, and not dying. So what they're trying to do is taking that, that antibodies and put it into our system. Once it's in our system, then our system can fight the venom from within, from with the antibodies. So that's, that's my understanding of it. Yeah. And the... And my understanding of, you know, say the evolution, say from YF to Crofab and, and the allergic um, reactions being higher with the earlier antivenoms is that, uh, first of all, they used a different animal, but then more importantly, they, they kind of went in and um, after the antibodies were created, like almost biochemically cleaved off, if you will, more of the, the actual animal aspect and you know is that kind of your understanding or how did they improve you know when we go from wyeth to crofab how did they improve on you know lowering the rates of uh people going you know having allergic reactions going into anaphylactic shock those types of things i'm sure they tried different processes and processes that uh and trying them on mice and other animals to see 
to a lesson. I'm sure that's they're just kind of testing and trial and error would be my guess. I'm not a toxicologist, so I wouldn't know for sure. But my guess is they're testing these on other animals. They're finding out, hey, this animal has less of a reaction to this particular antivenom. So let's try this and eventually get approval to go to human trials, you know, like like a lot of the drugs we do. Or just kind of like, you know, that's why they call it medical practice, because they're practicing. They're not sure. They're just trying this. They're trying that and seeing what works. And in time, they find a better procedure. Yeah. What um, so we've talked a lot about the history of snake bite treatment, and uh, we we've touched on the future with these uh, pills that you're talking about that will especially be valuable in some of these more less developed countries. What from where you're sitting, having looked back into the past, I mean, what do you see as the the future of, of snake bite treatment? Is it primarily these pills or do you think there's going to be improved anti-venoms? What, you know, how, how do you think that's all going to play out as we go forward? I think that the pills, uh, it, it, there's a lot of promising things looking at that. If that, if that ends up getting approved, this will be a huge, this could save tens of thousands of lives uh, just in third world countries alone. Now we don't have people dying here from that. Like, like you do there, but if you could buy someone five or six hours, to get to a medical facility to where they can get actual medical treatment, we're talking about a huge game changer. Now, you're still going to need to have the antivenoms to help treat the people as well. But if we can delay them by six hours, or 10 hours, and I don't know, they're still learning a lot of this stuff. I think that these things are going to be, we're, we're going to have a, a, a papers given on this at our conference. We're doing a biology of the pit viper conference next summer out of the rodeo in rodeo, New Mexico, where we have our desert museum. So there'll be a paper given there on that particular topic so it'll be interesting I'll, I'll be very interested to see that so because a lot of this i'm just hearing about it from different science and toxicologist friends of mine mm -hmm. but i don't know anything about it other than what i'm hearing and this from pill, these guys so it's the, all secondhand information yeah this pill is something you take when you get the bite so it's something you might keep on you or keep at your house and then if you get the bite you take it it's not something you take prophylactically you know that you're you're taking as a daily med oh with you in the field or whatever uh you know like i see you're uh, working the rice paddies you know your bare feet and you get bit you take it afterwards so it's okay. nothing you have to be you know take like you do for molecules before you go there you take it after you get bit gotcha okay and then that's why and more and more public here over the next you know probably six months to a year gotcha okay well but it is fascinating is there, is there anything about the book in particular, the, the structure, the content, uh, anything you think we missed that, that's really important for people getting an understanding of, of the book? We know we discussed, we, we discussed some of the, the basically the founders of, of the leaders of that industry going forward, talked about some of the more infamous and famous people. So there's that, there's some interesting stuff there in that as far as learning about Ross Allen and Bill Host and David Leakey and things like that. So I'm sorry, Jonathan Leakey. Um, so you're going to get some info, interesting information there, but the, just the photographs of these eclectic kits and snake oil stuff is just amazing to look at. It's almost like a, a, a trip back through the past to, to look at carnival uh, crazies. You know, it's kind of a, it's a fascinating read just for that. And we put some information in there about, you know, what the deadly snakes are out there and some different histories of different oils and, and who did the first kits and who did the first snake oils and, and moving through it. So it's a, it's a fun read and it's the, the photography. I had a good friend of mine do the photography and it's just, he did it, you know, everything was set up in a little, little studio. It's just phenomenal. Every little detail, a little bit of rust that's on the little lands that you see a little bit of it. Huh. That's great. Yeah. Okay. Well, any just final words kind of maybe at a high level that, you know, Again, why people why people should buy this book? Why they should put it in their collection? Just any kind of high level um, info you want to close out with? Sure. 
Well, I think it's a I think it's a great book for the history of, uh, of Americana and the in the world as far as snake bite. And you're going to see pictures of stuff you've never even thought of before. So, and you're going to learn a lot about the different the history of basically where we've come as a as a society when it comes to snake bite. The other thing I'd, I'd like to say: don't get bit by snakes. Be very careful. Um, don't buy a snake bite kit. Uh, and if you get bit by a snake, call 911, get to the hospital right away. And that's that's really the, 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 the takeaway. If you just get that, if don't try to treat it yourself. Call 911 and get to a hospital. If that's all you learned, you've got your $30 worth. <laughs> Great. Well, I am excited to uh, purchase a copy and get it onto my shelf. And uh, I'll be doing that soon. I encourage everybody else to, to do the same. And uh, if people are interested in purchasing the book, uh, where can they go to find it? Uh, they can find it. It's on ecouniverse.com. Uh, it's also on uh, amazon.com. And a lot of the different little booksellers, the different shows around the country uh, have it as well as far as their reptile shows and things like that. But probably ecouniverse.com is probably the best place to get it for or amazon.com. Great. And we'll put the links to, to both of those in the show notes so people can, can link directly to those from here. So, okay, great. Well, we'll begin to bring this thing in for a landing, but um, as you've been a guest before, you know I don't let any of my guests escape um, without telling me uh, their best snake story. And, you know, as you've already been on, you, you've told a, a snake story, but... Um, Perhaps you could think up your best snake bite related uh, story and share that with us today. Well, um, I'm trying to remember, recall what I told you the last time, but I, I do have a snake bite related story. And I was uh, I was in Australia for the first time. This is probably about twenty, see, it's twenty four, about twenty five years ago. And uh, I was with my current curator. Uh, Zach Hughes, who's, who's working for us now, and we were doing a trip around Australia. And uh, I flew, and in fact, I met John Can for the first time that, that that particular trip. We drove all the way up the coast. We drove all the way to the center and all the way around. We spent about three weeks driving in Australia. We rarely slept. We we're just catching snakes. And uh, we were in the home stretch, basically. We had left Melbourne. We were heading back or, up towards Sydney. We we're going to fly out in a couple days. And uh, as we're driving up the highway, we see it. An old house that would look like an old tin field, though, and you're like in South Carolina, the hurricane had wiped out. We were running the Murray River. So we pulled off. We hiked down there. We started flipping tin. We find uh, some blue tongue skinks and some odds and ends. And then under one piece of tin, we find a tiger snake, uh, which is, uh, I think it's, the, it's right up there in the top seven or eight as far as the LD50 rating. You don't want to get bit by it. So it's in, in the top 10 deadliest snakes in most people's lists. So it was a small animal, probably maybe... 24, 28 inches, something like that. So, of course, you know, we do our hero thing. We pick the snake up by the head and then you're holding it and you're getting a picture taken. you holding the snake, which is all well and good. And as I'm holding the snake, all of a sudden the thing, which was very limp in my hand, all of a sudden just went really tense. It was just like really trying to bite. And its fangs were kind of like going like that and on my hand. I could just see it like they just barely, I could almost feel it touching my finger like that. And the venom's running down my arms and holding the snake. And I'm thinking to myself, Am I the stupidest guy in the world? <laughs> you know, so luckily, I, and this venom is just barely, barely touching my, my finger. Uh, and it just, and as the venom stopped coming out of its thing, I didn't want to try to let go to let go of it until then. But once the venom stopped pouring down my arm, I just kind of like threw it like that onto the ground. And, uh, and I, I, sometimes I think about that. I didn't get bit. Huh. Uh, sometimes I think about that close call with that animal and we were didn't even have a pressure bandage at the time didn't have anything i was probably a, still a two hour drive two and a half hour drive from a hospital so depending on my reaction or to that bite um i may not have ever written this book and you might not be here right now so so uh, i don't do that anymore and i don't recommend anyone doing that so that's the one <laughs> that's that's something i learned 25 years ago and i have not done it since so i use equipment and tongs and, and the right thing but up and holding a snake like this to get your picture taken with you see a lot of people on YouTube and the influencing general public and all it just it's crazy you shouldn't do that because it's and not to mention it's very unsafe and you could die but a bite nowadays I mean a bite from a small rattlesnake is a hundred thousand dollar cost if you go to the hospital you better have good insurance I mean it's an expensive endeavor and it's a lot of pain so I don't recommend it but that's that's uh 
that's the dumbest, probably one of the dumbest things I've ever done, but that's my story. Yeah. And uh, you almost became a central figure in your latest book. <laughs> but it, you know, possibly by someone else wrote it though. <laughs> so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the other thing yeah. I would say is that a lot of, uh, I'm not saying you were handling this snake like this, but a lot of people who handle snakes in that fashion, um, you know, it's more dangerous for them. Um, but it's also more dangerous for the snake. Oftentimes they're pinning the snake and, and, you know, could potentially cause harm to the snake as well. So it's really better for everybody, snake and human included, to, you know, to, to handle them properly. Absolutely. Great. Absolutely. Well, um, really appreciate you uh, coming on the podcast, Bob. Like I mentioned, I encourage everybody to uh, check this book out and they can find uh, where to purchase that in the show notes. Um, so thanks for being here, Bob. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and I... I just wanted to uh, thank the audience and tell everybody to remember snakes are animals too, and it's a privilege to see one in the wild. Mm -hmm.